It's a funny place to be, stuck in a seemingly mundane world with an inner knowing that the universe is so much more than our mortal minds can comprehend. Yet we all have the capacity to know peace and our oneness with the wholeness of life. And through these interviews, discussions, and reflections, it is my intention to share this possibility. I'm Ryan Kurzak, and this is the Kriya Yoga Podcast. I'm going to be looking uh, at an old book of mine, uh, The Eternal Way, which is Roy Eugene Davis's commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. I've had this book, I think, since probably the first pressing of it, and you can tell it's a little scuffed up and old, but it's held together well. I was reading the other night um, the chapter on the Yoga of Discernment and Realization, and um, I've read this book so much that I have all kinds of things marked, and I have bookmarks here and there. And um, as I was reading, uh, this picture, Ramana Maharshi's picture, fell out of it, and I went to see where that came from. And uh, it occurred to me that I think that this little section of the Bhagavad Gita would be great for consideration today. So, this is from Sutra, or verse 21, of chapter 7 of the Bhagavad Gita. And chapter 7 is called The Yoga of Discernment and Realization. Verse 21 reads, Whatever form of God a devotee sincerely believes in and worships, to that devotee I bestow steadfast faith. And Mr. Davis um, clarified that verse by saying, However God is imagined or known to be, sincere devotion awakens soul qualities and attracts to the devotee influential support from the all-pervading field of God. And then he explains, the direct way to knowledge of God is to contemplate, ponder, analyze, meditate upon the aspect of God which seems most valid, while being receptive to unfoldments of insights that allow clear perception of the reality of God. If at first a devotee feels more comfortable seeking a relationship with God as a caring being, this relationship can be contemplated. Or, God can be contemplated as the omnipresent field of consciousness, a cosmic presence, light, sound, or as the absolute reality. So there's a lot in this paragraph to consider here. Um, First of all, the central theme is that however you can relate to a sense of spirit, consciousness, divinity, However that is real to you, that is the access point that you need uh, to keep yourself inspired and to keep yourself connected to whatever the reality of God or spirit is. So some people, um, depending on their type of devotion or their religion, see God or experience God in a certain way. For example, Yogananda, when he was younger, if you've read Autobiography of a Yogi, you know that he had um, a strong affinity for God as the Divine Mother or the Divine Feminine. And so whenever he would meditate and whenever he would pray, he would focus on his concept, his understanding of the Divine Feminine or the Divine Mother. And to him, that helped him connect more deeply with his spiritual process. Uh, However, Mr. Davis, I had heard him say one time, since he met uh, Paramahansa Yogananda when he was much older, Yogananda had only lived for a few more years after uh, Mr. Davis met him. This was quite a while after Autobiography of a Yogi was written. Um, Yogananda would say that he was more of an absolutist, meaning that he related to the infinite uh, more on an absolute impersonal level which was very different than, say, when he was younger. And that was that developed because of his own process, his own awakening process. 
And Mr. Davis talks about this in this particular passage. <clears throat> he says, If at first a devotee feels more comfortable seeking a relationship with God as a caring being, this relationship can be contemplated. Or, God can be contemplated as the omnipresent field of consciousness, cosmic presence, light and sound, or the absolute reality. And before that he says, It's good to be receptive to unfoldments of insights that allow the clear perception of your spiritual process. And this is another extremely important point because think about, think about it. When you first begin practicing meditation or yoga or your spiritual path, you have an idea of what it's going to look like at the end of the road. That's why you began practicing because you want to experience whatever you think the end of the road is. Now, it's not going to be true for everybody, but most people, I think, think this way. So if you are, say, 17, when you begin practicing and you're coming out of a, a devoted Catholic background, you might have a sense that the whole spiritual process is going to be meeting this being in white known as Jesus. Okay, well, when you're 17 years old and you're just getting started, if that's what inspires you, by all means, let that be your drive. Because even though that's not the ultimate end of it, it's, it carries your intention, and it carries your love, and it carries your devotion. And it's not the thing you're looking at that's so important. It's how it generates love and devotion within your life. Um, so as a person develops, you see, as they meditate and as they read and as they study, you're going to get insights into, well, what is the reality of spirit actually like? And as you go and you get those insights, you're going to have to let go of some of your old ideas. Just like when we talked about Yogananda, and in the beginning, he had this devotion towards Divine Mother and this great love for Divine Mother. Well, as he got older, he said he became more of an absolutist, which means, was he consciously sitting down to meditate upon Divine Mother? I don't know, I, I couldn't ask him. But the way it was described to me, I would imagine that what he was doing was simply sitting down and contemplating this more absolute, uh, pure, uh, clear, free of characteristics uh, reality. And so that is uh, the evolution of one person's uh, theoretical path, spiritually speaking. And if you're uh, reasonably alert, you're going to find that that happens to you. And you have to be comfortable making changes based on this growth that occurs. Letting go of the old, embracing the new. That's what's going to keep your meditation practice and your spiritual practice alive and interesting so that as you go through life, it will become more and more engaging for you because it becomes like a relationship that is dynamic. It's not just stuck and gets uh, rigid in its own old ways. It becomes something that you look forward to exploring and going deeper within to. There's another uh, saint that I learned about from Mr. Davis, uh, Shiva Puri Baba. And there's only one or two books on him, but this was uh, a saint who ended up living for, I think, about 135, 136 years. He walked around the world. I always found that his teachings were pretty no-nonsense and direct. And there's one, um, one little piece that I read about him where he was interacting with one of his students. And he had told his student, what you need to do is, if you need a form to worship divinity or, or your concept of, of what, what divinity is, use that form. Let that generate energy for you. Let that generate um, devotion for you. But try to spend a little bit of time, at the end of all that, just existing as though you are in an infinite, pure, impersonal reality of spirit. So he gave the advice to use what that, that student needed to remain engaged, but to every now and then let go of it all and just try to abide, exist in that free, clear, infinite, impersonal space. And this, this comes up again and again in, in the Bhagavad Gita, this idea that whatever you worship, whatever you see as God as divinity, 
that's okay because it will also help to carry you forward. And why is that the case? Because teachers often say everything is God, everything is infinite, everything is consciousness, everything is spirit. Okay, well, if everything is infinite and everything is consciousness and everything is spirit, well then you can worship your neighbor as the divine because it is, it's a manifestation of the divine. You can worship the work that you do as the divine. And the more you're able to do that, then you start to actually see that reality of spirit in all things. So um, use whatever you need that will help inspire you in this life to generate that sense of devotion and, and life and energy in your practice. Be open to growing and changing. For example, the, the way that I see uh, God, Spirit, Divinity now versus how I thought about it when I first got into meditation when I was 19 years old is pretty different because personally I have changed and I have grown and that's why we are here. So you don't want to hold on to what you think it's like because honestly it's not what you think at all. It'll never be what you think. And what we're learning to do is to use our thoughts, our ideas, and then let go of them, to outgrow them, to move from having to worship or having to see divinity in form to then seeing it in everything, to then being able to experience even in the formless. And there's a little bit more I want to read here before we meditate. Um, Mr. Davis quotes Shankara. Um, he says, Shankara, in his treatise on self-knowledge, wrote, Realize individual supreme consciousness, or the soul, to be distinct from the body, the sense organs, the mind, the intelligence, and non-differentiated primordial nature. It is the witness of their functions and ruler of them. As the moon appears to be moving when clouds move in the sky, so also to the non-discriminating, individualized supreme consciousness, or the soul, it appears to be active when in reality only the senses are active. As the movement that belongs to water is sometimes attributed because of lack of knowledge to the moon, which is reflected in it, so also enjoyment and other limitations which belong to the mind are falsely attributed to Supreme Consciousness. The nature of Supreme Consciousness is eternity, purity, reality, awareness, and bliss. Just as luminosity is the nature of the sun, coolness of water, and heat of fire. And then he concludes, this is Mr. Davis uh, speaking again. Any sincere endeavor to experience the presence of God brings the devotee's awareness into a relationship with it and attracts the grace which spontaneously flows. So the whole point of all of this, maybe you're inspired by nature and spending time in nature, observing the sun, observing a river, being in a river, observing trees, gardening. If that inspires your devotion, if that brings you a sense of spiritual awareness, use that. Let that be your access point. Use whatever you need. Um, but one final semi-practical thing I want to address before we meditate together today. Um, so the idea, any sincere endeavor to experience the presence of God brings the devotee's awareness into a relationship with it and attracts the blessing grace which spontaneously flows. We remember that. And then from Shankara, the very last sentence in this quote was, the nature of supreme consciousness is eternity, purity, reality, awareness, and bliss. Just as luminosity is the nature of the sun, coolness of water, and heat of fire. Now this is important, this final sentence here. In the Yoga Sutras, there is a, a methodology of experiencing samadhi, 
Some of you who have been at the Kriya Yoga Apprenticeship Retreats have heard me talk about this in detail, and I've also talked about it a little bit on the, the Kriya Yoga podcast. And we're going to spend a little more time these next few years digging into this. Um, but within the Yoga Sutras, there is a methodology which allows a person to experience samadhi. And the way you do that is by in a- actively engaging your consciousness, what's going on inside. Uh, many people, many people begin practicing Kriya Yoga, like we all have and we all do, where we're inspired to um, learn the Kriya Pranayama techniques and the, the Kriya Yoga techniques. But if we think about the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, uh, pranayama is within the first portion of the eight limbs of yoga. We have yama, niyama, asana, then pranayama. Then we go to pratyahara, internalizing our awareness, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi, which is meditation and focus. And so in the beginning, we have to start by practicing the yamas and niyamas, harmlessness, truthfulness, non-attachment, and so on. And then we learn to sit still, to practice um, asana, to be able to sit up straight, be still. And then we practice pranayama, which is alternate nostril breathing, kriya pranayama. There's a few different kinds of pranayama. But once we have these earlier stages down, now we're prepared to go within, pratyahara, to turn our attention within. And it takes a while to develop the ability to turn our attention within, but what many people do once they learn what they think is the full kriya pranayama is they just do the, the, the breath awareness and they just sit there. And they're going to be stiller more still, and they're going to have a greater capacity for relaxation, and they're going to have a greater capacity to experience um, super consciousness, because that's the whole purpose of the the techniques. But if you just stop at those techniques, you're not engaging the rest of the process, which leads to a state of samadhi. And so once we learn to practice pranayama, we have to learn to pull our awareness within. And you see, if we've already been practicing the yamas and niyamas, one of them which is non-attachment, we will absolutely be able to direct our awareness within because we're not attached to all the distractions, either in our mind or around us, so we can go within. Once you go within, now what? Do you just go within and then sit there? No. There are other stages. Uh, Dharana and dhyana, which is focusing on your chosen object of meditation at the exclusion of all else. And this is maybe easier for some, but usually it's not easy. It requires the foundation from the previous uh, limbs of yoga. And it requires you to be engaged, alert, awake in the process. So to tie this to everything we've been discussing, once you can direct your awareness within, that takes practice, Now you have your chosen ideal of what God, the Divine Spirit, is. So you begin to contemplate that. And what did Mr. Davis say contemplation was? It was to ponder, analyze, or meditate upon. That means it's like like you're within within yourself and imagine there's just like a a field, uh, your little laboratory inside. And within that laboratory, what are you doing? You're deciding, okay, this is my concept of the divine, so I'm going to think about it. I'm going to imagine what it would feel like to be in that presence, to know it, to experience it. And I'm going to keep doing that. And what that's doing is it's keeping your awareness within. It's also practicing the next limb of yoga, which is to focus on your chosen object. And it it requires a, a consistent practice, meaning you might get distracted a little bit. And then you look around, well, what's this? And you say, no, 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 get back to my point of focus. And eventually, once you become focused on what you choose to be your object of meditation, then you experience 
the seventh limb of yoga, which is actual meditation. That's where in the beginning you're just trying to focus on this line, and as you focus on the line, you jump around. So here's the line, it's moving, oh, well, it's, it's bouncing because you're not able to really pay attention to it. But you keep bringing your awareness back to it, focusing on it, and eventually you're able to just hold your awareness on it completely, no matter what's going on around you. That is actual meditation. When you're able to hold your awareness on it long enough, and if you read the Yoga Sutras, it says that essentially success in this happens after a long period of practice. It doesn't say uh, success in this happens after you get the right blessing from the right guru. It doesn't say that this happens uh, uh, after you find the magical technique. It says success happens after a long period of practice. And what happens once you're able to focus on it for a long time and you do it day after day and year after year, eventually it's as if you become that thing. And that's when the experience of samadhi or oneness is, is there. So you see, um, we want to consider the full scope of, of yoga, of Kriya Yoga, and not just focus it on a pranayama technique. You need to look at it as like an internal process that you're developing and cultivating. And finally, um, within this quote from Shankara, uh, Roy points out, not obviously, but if you pay attention you can see it, points out what is a really wonderful uh, point of focus. It says, the nature of supreme consciousness is eternity purity, reality, awareness, and bliss. So he, he tells you, the nature of supreme consciousness is eternity, purity, reality, awareness, and bliss. Why is that within this little passage? Because, yes, wherever you are, you need to use the access point that is um, interesting to you. However, if you want to experience what yoga and Kriya Yoga is all about, you have to let go of the characteristics that God is uh, a man with a beard in the sky and white robes, that God is an infinite, loving, motherly presence, that God is this, that God is that. You can use that, sure, and it'll work just fine. But in time, you have to learn to flow your awareness as closely as possible to what the reality of spirit actually is. And again, the nature of supreme consciousness is eternity, purity, reality, awareness, and bliss. So what do you do with that? What most people do with that is they say, that's great. So I'm just going to wait around and do my pranayama and sit there passively, and hopefully, eventually, eternity will dawn on me. Purity will dawn on me. Uh, bliss will dawn on me. That's possible. It happens sometimes. But this is a key because that means once you have meditated, once you are calm and once you are clear and you are internalized, in order to access that state of supreme consciousness, you then need to contemplate what is eternity like? What is purity like? What is bliss like? And you start with your words. You start with your own personal concepts. But you have to kind of stretch out of that. So if you're contemplating eternity, well, you think about the word first. And then you imagine, if I was aware of eternity, what would that be like? And you can imagine as though right now, what you are aware of, the room you're in, there are walls here. There's a horizon. There's a ceiling. Or there's the sky. You are aware of that. And you know what that feels like. Well, you have to kind of contemplate, well, what would it be like if my awareness could just keep going? You know, you can feel the, the boundary of your hands and your body, but what if you could imagine that you could feel beyond that? You get into the imagination, and it's abstract, but the whole process itself eventually becomes fairly abstract. And by using your focus to contemplate that to engage that. In the beginning, it feels like mental tedium. 
But eventually, if you keep it up, it's like, oh, you, you catch a glimpse of that might be what that feels like. And then you keep it up and eventually you're able to continue to expand in the sense of eternity and it becomes a, a real real a reality for you in your experience. So we have to remember, I mean, you, you know this, part of spiritual practice and meditation is to expand your consciousness. Well, that means you got to expand your consciousness beyond your possibilities, beyond your comfort zone. And that requires the the curiosity to wonder about these things. So we'll meditate here in just two minutes. Um, but what I'm just trying to encourage you to do is these abstract ideas that you think God might be like, infinity, eternity, purity, timelessness. That's the best words can describe. That's why in uh, the Holy Science, um, Sri Yukteswar talks about once you go beyond time, once you go beyond space and boundaries, then you're in sat or truth. You have to start contemplating those things and imagine what they would feel like inside while you're meditating. And then what happens is, if you really get into it, your meditation moves from, okay, we're just going to sit here for half an hour to an hour and go through the pranayama practice and maybe I'll feel a little bit better, a little calmer. And in, as the years go by and my understanding develops a little bit at, at a time, you move from that to, I really want to meditate. Then you become like uh, those yogis that you know about that they spend a long time in meditation. They're not doing it because their guru told them it's good for them or because it's a discipline or because good yogis do this and I'm a good yogi. They do it because it's interesting, because it's fun, because the inner world opens up to them. Um, so this is my way of trying to inspire you to go into the, the inner world more. Be aware your mind is a funny thing, and if you have uh, unresolved uh, quirks and idiosyncrasies and issues in there, um, they might pop up. So if you start having feelings like you are the Messiah or um, other kinds of interesting ideas about yourself, let those go. Keep returning your awareness back to the purity of spirit the infinity of spirit. That is what is most important to help to clarify your consciousness and to experience uh, the purpose of yoga and meditation, which is greater spiritual awareness. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to read one more time this passage from the Eternal Way, and then we'll meditate. And again, this is uh, verse 21 and Mr. Davis's commentary on that from The Yoga of Discernment and Realization. So whatever form of God a devotee sincerely believes in and worships, to that devotee I bestow steadfast faith. And Mr. Davis's interpretation, however God is imagined or known to be, sincere devotion awakens soul qualities and attracts to the devotee influential support from the all-pervading field of God. In his commentary, the direct way to knowledge of God is to contemplate, ponder, analyze, meditate upon the aspect of God which seems most valid while being receptive to unfoldments of insights that allow clear perceptions of the reality of God. If at first a devotee feels more comfortable seeking a relationship with God as a caring being, this relationship can be contemplated. Or God can be contemplated as the omnipresent field of consciousness. A cosmic presence, light, sound, om, or as the absolute reality. Shankara, in his treatise on self-knowledge, wrote, Realize individualized supreme consciousness or soul. So keep in mind, he's saying individualized supreme consciousness is the soul. To be distinct from the body, sense organs, mind, intelligence, and non-differentiated primordial nature. It is the witness of their functions and the ruler of them. As the moon appears to be moving when the clouds move in the sky, so also to the non-discriminating individualized supreme consciousness, it appears to be active 
when in reality only the senses are active. As the movement that belongs to water is sometimes attributed, because of lack of knowledge, to the moon which is reflected in it, so also enjoyment and other limitations which belong to the mind are falsely attributed to Supreme Consciousness. The nature of Supreme Consciousness is eternity, purity, reality, awareness, and bliss. Just as luminosity is the nature of the sun, coolness of water and heat of fire, any sincere endeavor to experience the presence of God brings the devotee's awareness into a relationship with it and attracts the grace which spontaneously flows. This episode of the Kriya Yoga podcast was made possible by donations from Kriya Yoga apprenticeship students and supporters of our Patreon community at www.patreon.com forward slash Kriya Yoga.